Hello, I'm Dr. Basil Considine. I'm here from the ACU Online Writing Center, and today we're going to be talking about writing hypotheses. This is a targeted webinar. It's designed to focus on this specific aspect of a selected assignment. We have a number of resources for other things that you might be doing related to hypotheses, such as, for example, formatting data or data analysis in APA 7th edition, but we'll have a recommendation for that later. For now, we're going to focus in on specifically what a hypothesis is and what you might want to consider when writing one. There's some slides about additional information related to the Writing Center. For a more in-depth discussion of these, just go ahead and see just about any of our other webinar recordings. For information on other assignments in this program that we have tie-in webinars such as this, go ahead and head to our Writing Webinars page, select your program in the tab guide, and then scroll down to your course number. If we don't have one for your course yet, but you'd really like one, go ahead and send us an email and we're always happy to consider that as we are adding to our choices. And sometimes it's something that we can point you to a related resource or do a custom recording just for you to answer your question or provide some support. With that, we're going to be beginning with discussing the properties of a strong research hypothesis. Then we're going to look specifically at a assignment in Leadership 786, and then we'll finish with the discussion about how to translate these things into outlining and drafting your paper. So what do we mean first by a research hypothesis? So, a hypo so what do we mean by a hypothesis? Now, you may be familiar with hypothesis as a proposal or an idea, but let's uh, look a little into the etymology of the word. So thesis, or thesis, as it's pronounced here, uh, thesis is a proposal or an idea. Uh, literally, the Greek means proposal. Hypo means under. So hyper is above, hypo is below. A hypodermic needle is one that goes underneath the skin. So a hypothesis this is talking about the underlying basis of a proposal. So if you're saying, oh, we should do that, your hypothesis is, well, here's what we think is going on, or here's what we propose is what we should do, and then we'll eventually move to the main proposal. So the hypothesis supports, and we want to test whether it is in fact actually supporting or just imaginatively. So a strong research hypothesis we want something that we can, in some shape or form, answer. We want it to first to predict a relationship and outcome. If we do X, what do we expect will happen? And this needs to be specific and simple, direct, ideally concise enough that we can be sure about what's being referred to. So not so broad as it could be subjectively answered. Uh, we want something that we can come to a more okay, this is what the data shows, or this is what we were able to count or measure and say, okay, yes, we did get X, or we did not get X. Or perhaps we got X, but there was this other thing. So we also don't want to make assumptions about readers' knowledge. And you know, to some degree, you might have acronyms that are introduced elsewhere and not repeated in the hypothesis statement, but we want this to be accessible and understandable in the sense of the hypothesis itself should be readable in what uh, is sometimes called plain English. And by that, I mean someone should have a reasonable idea of what this looking at, what you're proposing, even if they don't know what the specifics of what some term means. It should also be evaluated using observable and testable results. So there should be something that if someone else were replicating with the same people, they would get more or less the same thing. Uh, we want it to be relevant and specific to the question that's being answered and also to the problem that's being addressed. You, you don't want to just be answering something for the sake of knowledge. We want to be having a hypothesis as, okay, here's what we think we get out of that and it's important enough that we want to do it and find out for sure. You might think of any budget expenditure or big change in policy. You want to have some idea that this will be effective before you devote a lot of resources. 
Now, a question I often get from students is, what do you do if the answer to your research question is not what you were expecting, if it wasn't what your main hypothesis was for? Well, that's part of research. And ruling something out or finding what is actually going on, those are both very important things. And with that, I would say we, you should talk about how you generally don't have just one hypothesis. For the hypothesis, you have the outcome that you expect will, you'll get, and we'll call that the main hypothesis here. But the main hypothesis also has an opposite. Let's say your hypothesis is, oh, uh, we will get at least 90% on that. And then the opposite of that, or the null, will be, oh, we won't get at least 90% on that. So the null is fairly easy, uh, and we're trying to see, okay, which of those two? Now you might have an alternate hypothesis, or more, and that could be something like, okay, we're administering this test, and we expect people will do X for a main. They won't do X for the null hypothesis. And then the alternate might be, oh, well, uh, some number of people will quit <laughs> before they finish this test. And that's an alternate because it's not really an opposite of the main or null. It's its own, oh, something else is going on. And depending on what your research problem is, and especially if you're trying to identify what the root cause or the main cause or um, the most urgent thing, you may find different contenders, and so your alternate hypotheses are addressing these. Now here's an example. So let's say we're starting with students who eat breakfast will perform better on a math exam than students who do not eat breakfast. Now that is certainly a hypothesis, but looking back at our list here, we want it to be specific and direct about who exactly we're identifying because if we did this with college students versus elementary school students, we'd probably get some different results. So let's refine that. Let's make students more specific. Let's make that middle school students. And rather than eat breakfast, let's make eat breakfast before school. And because you might get different results depending on the exam, like if we give those middle school students calculus exams, they're probably all going to fail. <laughs> It's just uh, not something that they probably learned before. But if we make our specific, okay, middle school, and we're going to give them such and such a standardized exam, now we, we have a better idea, and it would be easier for someone to replicate that, you know, to be testable and testable consistently. <laughs> so but middle school students who eat breakfast before school will perform better on a math exam than middle school students who do not eat breakfast before school, as measured using the MAT-TN4 standardized exam. Now our null hypothesis is basically the same thing, but instead of will perform, we have will not perform. Now, you might say, well, okay, that's what I think we get overall, but here's this other case that we think might come up. And it's not that it's necessarily in conflict, but it might be separated out, or we might discover a different degree or severity or inflection. So rather than just say middle school students, we could have an alternate hypothesis for subcategory that we're also tracking. Middle school students from food unstable households who eat an in-school breakfast will perform better on a math exam than middle school students from food unstable households who do not eat breakfast before school as measured using the same exam. So by clarifying there's, there are these two specific subpopulations that are being examined, this may explain some what of what otherwise might be aberrations or confounding aspects of the data. Let's try another one. Like, what effects do year-round schools have on school costs and finances? Now, for main hypothesis, we might have year-round schools will be significantly more expensive to operate than nine-month schools as measured on a cost-per-student basis. And I know we'll just be inserting the not in there. Now, we might say, well, we're doing countrywide, but uh, some of these uh, 
schools are in Florida and you need so much air conditioning during the summer. And some of these are in Maine, you'll need so much heating during the winter. And say, okay, well, um, maybe we need an alternate hypothesis to cover a possible exception to the rest of the trend. Year-round schools in severe climates will be significantly more expensive to operate than nine-month schools as measured on a cost-per-student basis. You know, you'd want to define what you mean by severe climates and what exactly by year-round schools in another part of the document, um, in this case, probably in your eventual dissertation. But for the, the hypothesis itself, as with the research question, we want to have enough information for it to be generally understandable, and then by cross-keying it with other aspects of your document to get the full meaning. So let's take a look at one assignment that asks you to evaluate some data and craft hypotheses related to that. So this is coming from the Quantitative Analysis course, Leadership 786. This is the Pearson's Correlation Coefficient. And I will just say that uh, Pearson's Correlation Coefficient, or Pearson's R, is often confused because there are offhand at least four names for it that show up. But when we say Pearson's R and Pearson's correlation coefficient, we mean the same thing. So if we look at this assignment, we see that it's asking you to take an, a pre-prepared SPSS data set and to respond to some in instructions. So we have some background. A nutritionist, Sherry Berry, is curious if there's a statistically significant relationship between the quantity of turkey one eats at Thanksgiving and weight gain. She has hired you to be her stats guru. And so we have these two pieces of information, the quantity of turkey consumed as um, we'll call that operationalized. It has the number of bites and the weight gain in pounds. And so you're asked to specifically uh, analyze that uh, using the quantity eaten data and the pounds gain data as the variables being tested. Now we move on to the specific instructions. Okay, you need to write a appropriate null and alternative hypothesis. And if we look back here and see uh, if we're testing this, generally the main hypothesis will be a positive outcome for whatever the thing that you're checking to see if it's there. In this case, uh, we might have our hypothesis just be, there is a statistically significant relationship between the quantity of turkey one eats at Thanksgiving and weight gain in pounds. And then what would our null be? Well, I would say, look at that and see what would be the opposite? How do you cancel that out? And what's the alternative? What else might be going on? Um, and if you're not a big turkey eater yourself, you might just imagine all of the different foods that you might have at a hypothetical event and think about what your preference would be or what a family or friend's preference would be. Uh, personally, I love baking, so if I was doing this, I'd probably have something related to baking, but you, the point is not that the alternative hypothesis be uh, exactly what you would do, but that it is a plausible alternate that you might find with the data or that you might find helpful to use in uh, reconciling things you're seeing in the data. So let's look at the rest of the instructions. So you need to, per the reading instructions, to run a Pearson's R or Pearson's correlation coefficient as it's often uh, written out as. And you're supposed to not only relay what the findings are, but to discuss, okay, what do these mean? And what, what would you do with this? Or what can't you do with this? Or shouldn't you do with it? So the pretest criteria check, the Pearson's R analysis, so that's actually running the, the test. Uh, there is a specific output where you're asked for a scatter plot with a regression line and descriptive statistics, very easy to do in Excel. And uh, let's see, also to do a Spearman's row analysis, also with discussion of the findings and reporting those findings. 
And now that last part that includes the justification or non-justification of running a non-parametric analysis. So another way of understanding it is, well, which is more appropriate here? Pearson's R or Spearman's Rho? What does one show you versus the other and what should be used when making your decision? And if we look at this, we see that the assignment grading is mostly just have you done all these things. And the last 20%, the last two points there, are coming from the APA formatting. And if that's something that you're not sure how to format an APA style, well, then I'm going to recommend our formatting SPSS output webinar. You can watch the video, look at the slides immediately. And then we also have a formatting figures and tables in APA 7th edition webinar that would be very helpful and relevant. And also happens to use an example from Leadership 786. Now, if we look back at those instructions for outlining your draft, we can look and see, okay, there's that thing we're investigating and there are the two variables being tracked. And looking through the list of stuff we need to write. So in addition to the main hypothesis, the null and alternative, uh, the results of the Pearson's R pretest and what they mean. And same thing with Pearson's R and what that means. Do make sure to include the scatter plot. Uh, it is one of those things you're being graded on. Uh, same thing, the results and discussion for Spearman's row. And then which of these will be most appropriate uh, between three and four? Uh, which is more helpful for decision making? Another way of understanding the hypothesis is your main hypothesis is saying something's going on. It could be the volcano will not erupt in the next 90 days. It could be the volcano won't be erupting in 90 days. But our null hypothesis would be the opposite of that. Now, that thing doesn't happen, therefore, it must not be true, or not true under these conditions. And the alternative hypothesis is, okay, something other than what our main hypothesis is going on. And for some sets of data, some problems, you'll have many alternative hypotheses. And sometimes this is because you did a focus group or a preliminary survey or something, and you found a couple different things. Like, well, we can't really predict strongly which one's going to happen. So we're going to include all of these in hypotheses and see which one is supported by this. Now, brief review of some of the statistical terminology. So Pearson's R, the Pearson's R correlation coefficient is used to measure the linear correlation between two variables. So we basically, you run this test, you input the data for the two variables, and you get a number that goes between negative 1 and 1. If it's positive, that means that they're changing in the same direction. If it's negative, they're going in the next. And by the way, if you take a look at the very last bullet here, see if you can spot the typo, because this particular assignment does require that you have things be written well and formatted in APA style and making sure to do quality control like checklist. All right, so if you didn't catch that, it's on the third bullet, third word, negative should be negative. So now Spearman's row is also measuring the strength of the association between two variables, but it's a non-parametric test. So how things will look will be a little bit different. And, but we're still looking at positive one means we've got a perfect positive correlation. The opposite extreme, negative one means it's they're going in the opposite direction. And then the differences in values will be about the degrees. And remember that the last rubric item does include explaining why you'd use parametric versus non-parametric. OK. Now, when evaluating the results, it, it does help to focus on a couple core questions. So first, what are you seeing? Is there a positive correlation, negative, none? What is the strength of the association? You know, it, it could be very weakly positive, in which case you probably don't want to use that to inform policy. Or it could be strongly negative, and you're like, oh, that would have the opposite effect of what we want. So this concludes our webinar from today, just as a real quick recap. So we started out, we talked about the properties of a strong research hypothesis. 
we looked at a certain assignment from Leadership 786. We talked about how to translate those things that you are collecting for this assignment into your write-up and using those in the outlining drafting process. And if you have additional questions about formatting in APA style for SBSS output or formatting your tables and figures in APA 7th edition, we have these recommended resource slides. So with that, if you have any other additional questions, please feel free to email us at online writing center at ACU and have a great rest of the day.